good afternoon. Those of you who know me know that for the last decade I've been working almost exclusively on wrongful conviction issues. And in fact, I have an anthology that uh, alters the sweep of my resume. Maybe you've got, had an old one that was published this year by Routledge. So I'm, I'm pretty active in that field. I'm not a China uh, scholar, so the question is how do I get to be talking about the interrogation of suspects in China? <clears throat> well, here's how it happened. Uh, sometime around 2010, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Yuning Wu, came back from a trip to China with three books on wrongful conviction. And she said, it's a big deal there. So that was a big surprise. So she said, I'd like to do something. So we started investigating it and planned to write on the issue. And in fact, we have a review article in Crime and Criminal Justice International, for those of you who read Chinese on the side, <laughs> published, in, published in, in Taiwan. Well, <clears throat> in uh, 2011, uh, there was a meeting of the Innocence Network in Cincinnati focusing on international issues, and Professor He Jiahong from Redmond University was there, and it turns out that he was a professor of Dr. Wu, and she was a law student at Renmin University in Beijing, one of the top universities in China, and I said, write me an invitation, and in Cincinnati, uh, uh, Professor He and I sat down for half an hour and exchanged notes. And the next thing I, I know, uh, I got an invitation to the International Conference on Wrongful Conviction sponsored by Redmond University that was uh, to be held in Changchun, uh, which is uh, the, the uh, provincial head of the uh, uh, capital of Jilin province in Manchuria in, in 2012. So I attended. There were 250 people there, lawyers, prosecutors, police people. It's an important topic and issue. There were about a dozen foreign uh, scholars had been invited, and, uh, and I spoke then. And that whetted my appetite to do more work in, on Chinese criminal justice, but especially focusing on wrongful conviction issues. Uh, <clears throat> and. Um, uh, this led to a um, chapter that's uh, coming out in the Routledge book. Uh, the, the book is Contemporary Developments and Practices in Investigative Interviewing and Interrogation, two volumes. Uh, and so it, it's a compendium of articles about uh, police practices, interrogating uh, suspects and witnesses throughout the world. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, uh, my, uh, my uh, talk today is going to be taken from this chapter, but uh, I also want to expand it for uh, a more interpretive article uh, for a international law journal. There are three styles of police interrogation that are known throughout the world, so we shouldn't think only about China when we think about this. Physical abu physically abusive uh, uh, interrogation. Uh, so torture and physical uh, abuse in uh, gaining confessions are common in many countries, not just China. Uh, China gets a lot of press, of course, a lot of uh, bad press, uh, all of it, I think, uh, accurate uh, from our perspective. But um, it's not unique in that regard. In fact, uh, in the United States, and I've given a, Br uh, a Brown Dag lecture on this topic as well, uh, the third degree era, there was systematic brutal beatings of suspects throughout the United States, not just African Americans in the South, but uh, workers, immigrants, uh, usually working class people throughout the United States. This was well documented in the Wickersham Commission Report in 1930. Torture is a rational method. I know it's brutal, I know it's not nice, I know it can produce irrational results, but it is a rational way to get to the truth when you don't have any other evidence. Judicial torture was used in ancient Greece. There's a wonderful book by Page Dubois about the use of, uh, of torture in, in Athens. There was debate about that. In, in a cultural uh, marker, in ancient Athens, before a slave could testify, the slave had to be tortured. There was no option. That was called a touchstone. It was called basanos. It was believed by the Greeks that a slave, either by their inherent nature or because they were under the control of their master, could never tell the truth. And so by torturing them, we could assure that they would tell the truth. 
A free person, of course, could be trusted to give accurate testimony in a court of law. There's a lot of scholarship on this. Torture was used in the courts of ancient Rome, at first uh, to slaves, and then throughout the empire it expanded. Torture was a sanctioned legal method of uh, judicial inquiry in serious cases where uh, the evidence was not readily apparent throughout the Middle Ages, and it was, it was found in famous medieval codes. So unlike the ordeal where a person is, is uh, subjected to some walking on hot coals or burned, and then three days later if the person is healing, God is saying that, that uh, uh, the, the, the person is guilty or innocent. Uh, torture um, uh, is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a rational method. Um, Edward Peters, uh, Yale scholar, uh, distinguished judicial from executive torture. In the 20th century, <coughs> uh, brutal regimes, uh, uh, juntas in Argentina and Greece in the 70s and 80s, of course, the Soviet and the Nazi regimes used torture, but not so much to get to the truth of a judicial inquiry, but, but uh, uh, basically to abuse and degrade people that they saw as enemies of the state. But what we're talking about in China what we were talking about in the third degree era was judicial torture. Torture, to get to the truth, was a specific criminal case. Psych physically abusive torture disappeared in the United States, uh, and exactly why uh, is, um, is uh, an, an interesting question. It has been replaced by psychologically, I think maybe abusive, but, but by psychological pressure, psychological coercion. The famous in bao read method in the United States, uh, police are trained to assume the guilt of the person they're interrogating. The purpose of an interrogation is not to get to the truth, but to get a confession. Uh, police are trained to prevent suspects from giving plausible explanations of their innocence. Uh, they, they talk in a way to maximize the suspect's hopelessness. So after a half an hour or an hour or several hours, the suspect says, I am going to go to prison. I'm going to get the death penalty. There's no help. And then uh, the uh, officers are trained to minimize the guilt of what the person did and uh, use that as a technique to get confession. It's a very powerful method. Uh, I'm sure it does work on people who are, who are guilty. The problem is it's so powerful that it's led to hundreds of known false confessions, and that's, that's the big issue today in American criminal justice. In some European countries, in England, there is a, a, a new model uh, that is much less coercive. In England, uh, there's an acronym, the PEACE model, when uh, officers believe after P, preparation and planning, careful review of the case, that there's a good chance that the suspect is guilty, they prepare and plan for the interview. They form, formulate objectives. They then, E, they engage and explain. They develop rapport with the subject. They engage the person in conversation. Then they seek to elicit an account using cognitive interviewing techniques that are not coercive at all. <clears throat> That's for another lecture. <clears throat> um, if, indeed, incriminating statements are made, and in England it's supposed to be done uh, videotaped, and, counsel present. Uh, C stands for closure. The officer summarizes the main points from the interview, provides the suspect with an opportunity to correct or add inf information. And E uh, it stands for evaluation. Once the interview is finished, uh, the information gathered must be eva evaluated in the context of all the other information in the case. So it's a more, <clears throat> um, it, it's probably as, as effective um, as, uh, as uh, U.S. interrogation. Uh, <clears throat> I may add this later in my notes. In the United States, approximately 80% of all suspects who are uh, interrogated by the police waive their Miranda rights and talk. And of those 80% who talk, about 60% provide uh, either a full confession or some incriminating uh, evidence. So uh, confessions, talking to people, are still very common in police technique. Now, what I want to talk about uh, today are <clears throat> the cultural context factors surrounding police interrogation styles. I'm only going to mention them now because this really 
is the, is the beginning of the conclusion, but I want to give you some idea where we're heading. Uh, once I'm done describing the Chinese situation, uh, we're going to look at crime rates. The higher the crime rates, the greater the perception that people are subjected to crime, the more likely it is that the police are going to use abusive te techniques if they don't have appropriate and effective other kinds of techniques at, at hand. Public opinion plays a role, and we'll see that errors in wrongful conviction cases, when they came to light, place some pressure on the Chinese government to moderate police interrogations. Uh, so uh, crime rates and wrongful conviction cases play in two directions. Uh, people say, gosh, we don't want innocent people to be convicted. On the other hand, they say criminals are getting away with it. So, so there's that, that kind of problem. Uh, that's my, that's my, my co-author on this, on this article. Is, is, has a class in a few minutes, but I appreciate that uh, Dr. Dr. Yuning Wu is, is here. Uh, <coughs> In my conclusion, when I compare the third degree to Chinese practices, I'm going to give you my own theory about social citizenship very quickly. But when we talk about China, we also have to think about regime type, because China is an authoritarian regime. Uh, I, unlike the US, where some domestic issues can be separated from foreign policy issues, in China, it's all one big ball of wax. The, 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 uh, Domestic policies are, are designed uh, to, to support larger national goals, uh, which in a book which I don't have with me was summarized as wealth and power. I'll try to explain that. And finally, we end with uh, who is going to control people at the, at the lower levels, law or the party? Uh, a month ago, I would have said the party, but uh, uh, this is a, a, an unusually good time. I'm glad I didn't give this talk at the beginning of the semester because in October, the Communist Party had a plenum where they advanced the rule of law and, and there's, there's something to that. So there's some very interesting things going on in China. All right. <coughs> very briefly, some justice developments in, in China. Uh, after a, uh, a century of disorder in 1978, Deng Xiaoping uh, became the paramount leader and uh, instituted reforms that we're all familiar with. China has uh, achieved the status by now of the second largest economy in the world, and it will, without a doubt, become the largest economy in the world uh, very, very soon. Um, and uh, in order to stimulate that, uh, that enormous bur burst is not the quite the right word, powerful uh, economic movement, China needed stability. Uh, the legal writers suggest there were three kinds of stability. For social stability, property stability, and market stability. Social stability is achieved through the use of the criminal law and the criminal procedure law. So the criminal justice system is needed to provide some stability at a society that is changing very rapidly and, and with a lot of crime and disorder occurring in the wake of the, of the movement of hundreds of millions of people from uh, rural communities into large, large cities. <clears throat> but um, the Chinese government had its eye on, on market stability and property stability. Uh, in order to achieve that, in the 1980s and 1990s, China instituted hundreds of new law schools. I, Bob, I <laughs> like the, the idea. Uh, and educated tens of thousands of lawyers, including uh, Dr. Wu, a uh, graduate of one of the top law schools in China, Renmin University. Um, and uh, most of them uh, participate in, pro in commercial and civil law. As in the US, uh, criminal law is a very small, small specialty. <clears throat> and that has provided uh, a good deal of property stability. <clears throat> now, when we talk about property stability, we're concerned about theft. Uh, as the Chinese economy has become more complex, uh, China has had to modify its criminal code to deal with much more advanced methods of, of stealing uh, a white collar crime, uh, uh, advanced economic kinds of crime. The other side of property stability is to be protected against government confiscation. And the largest domestic issue in China uh, uh, it, 
thinking that may be the environment, but is corruption. And the, the enormous burgeoning of the Chinese economy gave those in power uh, uh, the opportunity to confiscate uh, uh, illegally uh, enormous amounts of wealth and property. And uh, we're now in the process with the, with the new very powerful, uh, uh, power, uh, he may be a paramount leader, uh, Xi Jinping, this massive anti-corruption campaign. He's going after people at the very top in the military and civil. And, and the whole goal of that is to make China stronger by making people confident that, that, uh, that they, won't, <coughs> they won't be ripped off by the government. Uh, at the end of my notes, I indicate that there are maybe, there are thousands of riots every year. I'm not sure what number, but 10,000 riots uh, uh, in, in China. <coughs> when politics are bottled up, that's the way people express their, their distress and, and seek uh, to, re to uh, redress grievances. And one estimate is, was that 65% of those were stimulated by illegal uh, 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 taking of property, usually real estate, by governmental officials. So that kind of corruption is a major destabilizing element. <clears throat> and so the people at the top of the party are very insistent on, on, on stabilizing the country. <clears throat> Now, in 1979, just as um, uh, Deng was, was beginning his work, uh, a, a criminal procedure law, CPL, based on the Soviet model, it was in, inquisitorial. It fit the nature of the Chinese criminal justice system. By, not, it, by 1996, a lot of Chinese lawyers were educated in America and in the West, and they were infused with ideas of an adversarial system and, and defendants' rights. And a new CPL uh, came into, uh, was enacted to a great amount of hoopla, saying this is going to bring in a liberal new era. But uh, it turns out within a few years, uh, merely passing a code is not enough to change practice. And so the abusive kinds of criminal justice practices <coughs> continue to occur. <coughs> there was still a lot of pressure, especially concerning coerced confessions in 2012. Uh, there were major uh, changes to the CPL with strict exclusionary rules uh, to, to exclude evidence uh, obtained by, by torture. But the underlying, the problem is that the underlying inquisitorial system did not change. And um, uh, the ex uh, <clears throat> uh, certainly after 1996, expected behavioral changes among police prosecutors and judges did not materialize. I'm not too sanguine that they will change. Well, what is the, very briefly, what does the CJ system in China look like? Judges are not part of a separate branch of government that has final say over legal interpretation, as is the case here. Uh, they they uh, have some respect and authority, but certainly not the respect and authority accorded to judges uh, either in the US or in the European inquisitorial system. <clears throat> Until recently, they've been weakly educated, many were not lawyers. Now, <clears throat> we're beginning to see more uh, legally trained uh, judges. But basically, they operate uh, as bureaucrats uh, on a par with the police, the public service bureau, with the prosecution, the procuratorate, and the courts. Uh, the uh, trial courts uh, for lower cases are basic, uh, serious cases intermediate and high courts are at the provincial level, and then there is a Supreme Court of China. Um, what is important is that <clears throat> at the town level, at the city level, at the county, at the provincial, and at the national level, all of these, the heads of the police, prosecution, and courts meet together in a politics and law committee, and that is a party committee. <clears throat> um, the dominant party official convenes. Uh, in the past, it was usually the police chief. So here you have the prosecutor and the judge and the police chief sitting around a table. And the police chief is the one who convenes the meeting. And the judge is just another part. So Bob, you're not familiar with this. I see you smiling. Oh, well, take, take my word. Well, well, I think you've answered my question. Yeah. It was going to be, is there any semblance of an independent judiciary? I think, I, I think you've just answered that question. In criminal justice, no. There may be, there may be in commercial law, there may be, but I, I'm 
I'm not familiar. But the judiciary is essentially an <coughs> arm of the administrative apparatus of the state. My notes say, uh, and this is from the dean of the Peking Law School in 2010, that the political legal committee is designed to ensure that the judicial decisions, quote, keep with macro level development goals. So, um, okay, uh, a news item. Uh, uh, December 2nd, uh, 2014, I have the site here. Uh, an official said the Politics and Law Committee is the blade of the party and the Public Security Department, the police, is the edge of the blade. So, <coughs> so that, that may express some of the, some of the, the attitudes. They work together. Uh, there's a very good novel written by He Jahong, uh, the scholar at Renmin University, uh, uh, showing how a wrongful conviction could be developed by this committee working together. But the defense lawyer has to be very clever. All right, police investigations. When a person is charged with a crime and brought into custody, uh, interrogation is mandatory. It's not optional. The person must be interrogated by at least two officers. The suspect is required by law to answer questions truthfully. The only option that a person has to not answer a question is that the question is not relevant to the crime. But in practice, that's not going to go very far. Now, the CPL forbids torture. Uh, all the laws do. Lawyers are, are, uh, were not present at first interrogation, and even under the 2012 changes, it looks like the police do not have to allow a, uh, a lawyer to be present at the first interrogation. After that, uh, the lawyer may have a chance to, to talk to the client. But uh, certainly under the 1996 CPL, the police could be present at lawyer-client conferences. Uh, the police construct dossiers. That's usually the basis of the case. Now, that's actually often true in the United States as well, except that uh, a criminal defendant who, you know, who has the means can certainly develop their own evidence. But in China, almost all the evidence is produced by the dossiers. And unlike the high level of confessions in the U.S., maybe 50% of the cases, as we see in China, the McConville study of, of 1,500 cases found that, uh, that confessions were made in 97.1% of the cases, and 92% of those were full confessions, and 5% were partial confessions. Uh, earlier study by Lou and Meathy found 67%. So confessions clearly are very important. <coughs> the trials are decided on the basis of the police dossiers. The, 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 what they say in China is that the police cook the rice, the prosecutors serve the rice, and the judges eat the rice. So that, uh, that's an, a, a way of saying that trials are to a, 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 great, uh, to a great degree rubber stamping what the police have, have come up with. Uh, <clears throat> the live uh, testimony uh, and witnesses and cross-examined cross-examination do occur, but they are rare. Uh, the evidence seems to be that in many cases there is no lawyer and that the evidence is, is purely presented by the dossier. Uh, my reading of the newspapers of the uh, famous trial of Bo Lai uh, last year was seen as an advance for the rule of law because the lawyer was actually able to, to cross-examine it. And this is sort of like a, uh, a, major, a major change. Um, aggressive defense lawyers are sometimes punished. There are some famous cases dealing with dissidents where they've even been jailed. Um, in uh, McConville's uh, uh, large book, uh, where he has many excerpts of, of trial dossiers themselves, uh, a person will say, I was tortured by the police, and the court will simply ignore it. Just, sort of, they just go on and, and conclude the case. And guilt is effectively presumed in, in the system. So their uh, acquittals do occur, but they are very rare. <clears throat> so that's just a quick overview of obviously a very complex process. The importance of interrogation and confessions to the legal system cannot be uh, overestimated. Here are just a few, a few quotations. Uh, one anonymous respondent told McConville, the case cannot be deemed to be detected without the suspect's confession. So it's as if 
without that, it's uh, almost as if you had a trial in the U.S. without evidence. Uh, <clears throat> a confessions accounted for a third of the dossier items. So that was other studies that reviewed that. So, and not just one confession, there were often multiple confessions. Uh, set, uh, the confessions were very important for sentencing. So the more remorse you show, the more likely it is that you're going to get a lenient sentence. And that may be true in other uh, judicial systems as well. It's certainly true in the U.S. with our high, high emphasis on plea bargaining. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be too dismissive of what goes on there. There, there, there are a lot of problems with American uh, justice. And then just a few other. A judge <coughs> in um, uh, this article by, a very important article by Belkin, uh, referred to the high probative value of confessions and uh, in, in the view of limited investigative resources, basically he was saying that the, process, that the police will focus on the confession and then use the confession to go find other evidence, which is kind of uh, a backward way of doing things. And a defense lawyer in China who had been a police officer uh, rather amusingly said that the Chinese are the most successful police in the world, but then he said, we're not the smartest. We just get confessions from people. So there's wide acknowledgement that confessions are, are very important. Okay, if there are so many confessions, one would think that there's going to be a lot of abuse, and in fact, there is a lot of empirical uh, evidence of torture. In 1997, the Chinese government became very open about this. It didn't hide this at all. This was stimulated to some extent by wrongful conviction cases. So it's out front saying that we have a problem and, and it's willing to admit it, um, whether it's willing to completely do what it has, has to do to eliminate it is, is, uh, is another question. Uh, McConville's massive study of uh, 11, I'm sorry, I said 1,500 cases before, 1,144 cases in 13 sites throughout China uh, took its data from the intermediary court records, and in it, it, inf it found allegations of torture in half the cases. Now, actually, that makes kind of rough sense to me. If everybody is interrogated, police are, are not, I'm not, we're not saying that police who, who use force uh, in the third degree era or in the US or in China are sadistic. They, they're being driven by production goals and they'll, they'll use force when they have to. And uh, they, need, they seem to think they need it in about half the cases. It just makes a certain amount of common sense to me. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a study by uh, Hung uh, Liu of uh, Hong Kong uh, University uh, in two sites in China, uh, 123 cases. Uh, he found a coercive interrogation in the less serious cases in 66%. I'm not sure why in the more serious cases in 36%. He was not quite as, as careful as, um, as the McConville study in explaining how he concluded that suspects, quote, were forced to accept coercive interrogations. But <clears throat> that's, that's some data. <clears throat> um, some defendants... Uh, so police defend torture. Uh, oh, well, well, first of all, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the kinds of the usual things that you know you'll, you'll expect: beating, hanging, electric shocks, forcing suspects to stand in extreme heat, cold, deprivation, food, water, and there's more. Uh, there was a UN uh, report. Uh, Belkin, uh, I have his name spelled there wrong, um, was a um, was attached to the U.S. Uh, embassy in Beijing. He was then a Ford Foundation fellow. He was a very experienced uh, lawyer. And, uh, <clears throat> so uh, there's little doubt that this sort of thing goes on. <clears throat> there are books about uh, the conditions in Chinese prisons. They're very, very rough. So um, what you'd expect. <clears throat> Professor Tri Min, uh, when I was invited to that conference in Changchun, uh, I was on the same panel with him. Uh, it, was a, it was a privilege to meet him. He was an older man. He's, he said some very, he was a professor at a, at a police university. Um, he said some very wise things about the relationship between structure and, uh, and justice uh, at that talk. And uh, he didn't speak Chinese, so later, 
when he was standing next to someone who did, I, I engaged him in a conversation, and he started talking about his own experiences of being held under house arrest during the uh, Cultural Revolution. So uh, then later someone said, ah, yes, Tree Min, he knows just how far to go without being sent to prison. So that's the kind of system that we're in. Well, he collected all of these quotes that were, that were, uh, that were quoted in, uh, in uh, a Belkin's article. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, and I have the longer quotes here. I have a whole page of them. One officer says, all things that work in practice are reasonable. If it, if it works, why not? Then, um, then uh, what difference does it make if you hit a bad person a few times? They're kind of, kind of rough, but they're criminals. So, you know, you smack them around a bit. And then I love this one because it picks up from, from uh, Dong Xiaoping's famous statement, you know, when, when he moved uh, China to a, to a capitalist position, what does it matter if it's a black cat or a white cat as long as it catches mice? So here you had a, a detective picking that up and applying it to interrogation. Uh, so what difference does it make if you hit a bad person a few times? Criminals do ho horrible things, murder, robbery, rape. There is no evil they won't do. You can't show these thugs any mercy or weakness. When the time is right, if you don't step up, what kind of a man are you? So, you know, it's an attitude that you'd expect from an honest cop who says we're really doing, doing the right thing. Uh, I remember uh, Detroit had a practice of uh, arresting three people for every murder, uh, knowing that two of them were really only suspects. Uh, were not suspects, but were only witnesses, but they were too afraid to talk. And I was once taken to lunch by a, a high uh, ranking, bless you, high ranking police detective. He says, "How else are we going to are we going to get convictions against murderers?" You know, they were really concerned. Murder in Detroit is a very serious problem. So. Rough means by people who have moral goals. It's an old ethical question. All right. A big issue has been false confessions and wrongful convictions. And of course, this has been the subject of a lot of research, and uh, Bonnie Wu and I have spent a lot of time uh, on this. There were <clears throat> several notorious cases, and these notorious cases aroused a lot, a lot of public anger. And the government responded because anything that disrupts the public is going to undermine the power of the state uh, the, and, and the party, especially. Uh, prior to the 2012 conference I attended, there were two uh, national conferences in China. Uh, the government was embarrassed by wrongful convictions. Uh, Chinese uh, criminal justice officials don't want to convict in innocent people any more than American police officers do. Uh, as I said, the larger issue is that the government must respond to major sources of popular discontent as society becomes wealthier, more tied to internet and social media, more knowledgeable in order to provide preserve the dominant power of the party. Uh, the government has invested resources into exploring uh, the wrongful conviction issue. It wants to know what's going on. It wants to know how people feel about it. It wants to reduce uh, wrongful convictions. By the way, it's released thousands of, pris thousands of prisoners believed to be wrongfully convicted. It's paid compensation to some. Uh, but the question is, how far is it willing to go to reduce wrongful convictions? Um, uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, unwilling, generally, to drop its tough on crime measures, although it's moderating them uh, to some degree. Um, it's not going to scrap its system and introduce Western-style legal system with a robust protection of individual rights, any more than the U.S. is about to dump its irrational jury trial system for a better designed quasi-inquisitorial uh, model another paper I'm working on with a German lawyer. So there, there, there are much better ways to do justice, but you know, 1215 and the fourth ladder in council and all the rest is history for those of you who are into that subject. So <clears throat> one of the things the government has done is was to create exclusionary rules. Torture is forbidden, subject to exclusionary rules. In uh, the 1996 EPL, uh, there, were, there have been major uh, led to a major debate and reforms in 2012. The, the rules are much stricter. They apply specifically to different agencies. Uh, on paper, the rules are very strict. I'm skeptical that they're going to change. By the way, there's a ton of law review articles on this. So this has really been 
but I'm not going to spend much time on it here. <clears throat> so now I want to get back to the conclusion, the, the, the points that I raised at the beginning that, that I really want to talk about. The cultural context factors surrounding police interrogation. So one is crime rates, crime rates and public opinion. Crime is a serious problem in China. Crime undoubtedly increased uh, as uh, China's enormous uh, economic growth created tremendous social upheavals, movements of people, weakening informal social controls, traditional controls. They, uh, there's a huge floating population, as it's called in the cities. There are news reports of gangs, uh, organized crime, triads uh, in the cities. Bo Lai was successful in, in dealing with uh, very rough organized crime uh, uh, in the city uh, that, that, that he controlled. And when people see criminals go free on what they consider technicalities, that's going to work in the opposite direction of being outraged by people who are wrongfully convicted. Uh, in a study by uh, Lin, Zhao, and Wang, they found that one-fourth of their surveyed respondents said that it would be okay for the police to use torture if they had information that there was a bomb on the bridge. You know, the, the, the terrorist is out there with the atomic bomb. 10% supported police torture to get a conviction, conviction from a purse snatcher. So I'm not sure that even Americans would go that far, but who knows? It may depend on where you are in the US. 33% supported police torture if an accomplice refused to cooperate. And over half accepted the use of police extortion of confessions against murderers. So uh, uh, it, it might be interesting to see whether or not there's similar opinion in, in, in the US, except we're not usually used to thinking about police torture. So, so that's part of the cultural context. Now, um, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, the Chinese government uh, instituted what were called strike hard campaigns where there were roundups of criminals, there were mass trials, the, the number of executions spiked, the, the death penalty advocates uh, you know, were, were, were challenging. Uh, China about that. Uh, <clears throat> and there clearly was a tremendous push in that era as, as China, China's economy was developing to, to deal with this, what appeared to be a real surge in crime. It used very rough, very brutal methods. Now, China has been tamping down the use of the death penalty. It's still higher than any place in the world, but uh, the number of crimes that are subjected to the, to the capital punishment are being reduced. It appears uh, that, that the number is going down, but we don't really know because the number of people executed in China is a state secret. So, um, uh, but, but there does appear to be a, uh, an attempt on the part of the Chinese government to be no rougher than they feel they have to be. So there's a certain rationality behind their crime control methods. Now my thesis is that there's some parallels between the third degree era in, in America uh, and, uh, and the police in China. They're under tremendous pressures. My own theory about why the third degree erupted, well, partly because there were no police forces be before the 1880s, 1890s, except in a few cities. My thesis is that police in the US <clears throat> in the 1890s into the 1930s were under tremendous production uh, quotas, so to speak, to really get to crime. Why? I mean, just think about cities 100 years ago. You know, uh, you had uh, a, a middle class living very comfortably on, on uh, you know, tree-lined uh, avenues. You know, we can see some of those as we drive up third to go home on, in, in Woodward. And then there were the teeming masses, right? Uh, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, who were, who, were, who were really seen as dangerous classes and needed to be controlled. And there probably was indeed some higher crime, if not by the immigrants, according to the criminological knowledge, their, their children. Uh, and, and the police were not constrained by so many uh, procedural rules as we have today or, or education. And they, they used the means that came, that came at hand. And so, my thesis is that those who were subjected to the third degree in the U.S. were people who were literally not citizens or were not social citizens. They were not treated as if they were citizens. Uh, uh, 
the uh, in the South, of course, it, it was it, in, it included part of Jim Jim Crow uh, uh, repression, but uh, the the use of torture by American police in, in that era is is, is well attested. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that it changed. I mean, it, it it could change, and the question is whether or not it, it might change in China. Well, I, I don't think I can answer that, but let me say a few words. Uh, 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 China is an authoritarian regime, so uh, whatever one said about the, the U.S. 100 years ago, uh, uh, we, we were uh, under the conditions of that era a, a, a liberal a liberal state with opportunities for individuals to have access to courts to challenge uh, the government, and that's uh, that's not really the same in China. Um, it's a uh, it is committed to, to preserving the one party state, and I think uh, I'm certainly not alone in thinking that a lot of the problems uh, that China has comes out of that need to say we're not going to have political competition, and it, it forces I think. It, forces the Chinese government into, into positions and actions that in some ways undermine what it's trying to do. But you know, then again, if I wanted to suggest changes to American trial structure, I'd have this little matter of the US Constitution <laughs> and the Sixth Amendment guaranteed the, the right of a, of a traditional uh, trial uh, 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 to deal with. So we all have our, our ideological uh, pre presuppositions. Um, the, um, the Chinese government under President Xi Jinping, a party leader uh, and a military uh, head as well, has been aggressively combating corruption, arguably the major source of popular discontent against the government and the party. He's also expressed strong hostility to Western democratic values, and until recently, legal values as well. Whether this has changed in the last month or two is, is fascinating. So um, you'll have to take this with kind of a, <clears throat> this is like an earlier writing. Um, as we've already seen, the Chinese criminal justice system is described as a three-member family or iron triangle in which police prosecution and court work together to fight crime. And they're coordinated by party by the CCP political legal committees at the various levels. Compared to their Western counterparts, Chinese courts uh, are weak in assertions of judicial independence. Uh, if they apply, apply to the courts as institutions, but not to individual judges. Uh, <clears throat> lawyers uh, tend to be distrusted. Criminal lawyers tend to be distrusted. They're viewed essentially as just helping criminals. Lawyers' organizations are supervised by the government, and as I indicated, lawyers can be imprisoned for overly aggressive advocacy. Uh, and as I already indicated, this is sort of a summarization, torture and wrongful convictions are of concern to the party. They would prefer that it doesn't happen. The central government passes legislation excluding this kind of evidence, but doesn't seem to be willing or able to change the structure of uh, Brad is about to uh, don his toga and go off to the go off to the Wayne State Senate. <laughs> Ave. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you read books like uh, Orville Schell and John Delury's Wealth and Power, uh, China's Long March in the 21st Century, or Noah Feldman's Cool War: The Future of Global Competition. We get a picture of the larger long-term goals of China. We see China rapidly expanding its military power into the seas. Uh, November Harper's uh, has a, uh, an article by uh, a China expert um, describing in detail the, uh, the uh, China's military expansion uh, uh, by ship and by, by military plane, by commercial and fishing boats. Uh, in uh, all of the seas uh, that are surrounding it. Uh, uh, Feldman suggested that uh, we are going to be facing an era of the new Cold War. Cool War, because unlike our relationship with the Soviet Union 30, 40 years ago, where there was very little commercial interaction, of course, with tied to the hip with China, so it's very interesting. Um, and um, uh, 
Uh, Howard French writes in this article, paradoxically, China's new behavior appears to be a reflection not only of rising capability, as it's gained in wealth and military prowess, or self-confidence, but also of rising insecurity among the Communist Party's leadership, whose legitimacy in the country's post-ideological era has always rested on the narrow twin pillars of strong economic performance and nationalism. So, as I indicated before, when China seeks to do something internally, like fight corruption, its goal, if we listen to Orville Schell and Delury, has been to I don't want to say avenge, to overcome the humiliation of this great power being subjected to uh, control by Western powers from the, the 1800s in, into the middle of the 20th century. Uh, Chinese smart at that, uh, and they see themselves as becoming uh, a great power in the world, and, uh, and they want to assert it. That's why I'm not good on graphics. I thought the choice of the Chinese flag flapping in the breeze uh, off the back of, a, of an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea uh, is a perfect, uh, uh, a, a perfect uh, depiction of what I'm ending, what I'm ending my, my, my lecture with. Um, so <clears throat> um, there's this larger reason why, why China is playing these various games with, 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 uh, with the law. Now, at this point, um, I, I become the, the, uh, the silent mouthpiece for the economists because these events are so new, I don't know what to say except to report them. In October 2014, right, yesterday, uh, for the first time ever, an annual plenum of the Chinese Communist Party was devoted to the rule of law. This, this is the first time now in 40 years. And uh, this is what we know <clears throat> from news reports. It's a, it's a major uh, a document, uh, 17,000 characters. Is that long? Yeah, OK. I mean, I said for those of you who read Chinese, was endorsed by the party's 370 member central committee. The party's new slogan is now socialist rule of law with Chinese characteristics. And um, uh, Constitution Day has been declared. It's December 4th. So tomorrow is, is Constitution Day. Uh, they hope that by 2020, it will lead to extensive and profound changes. Where does this enthusiasm for the rule of law come from? And um, these uh, smart, uh, sharp-eyed folks at The Economist uh, believe that it comes out of uh, Xi Jinping's campaign against corruption. Uh, he aims to restrain officials and prevent the ran rampant corruption of, from causing public anger to boil over. That has the capacity to seriously weaken the Chinese state to the point where it casts the party into, into opprobrium and, and perhaps would, would cause a, a serious call for other kinds of political leadership. The Central Committee has decided to make local courts more impartial and to penalize officials telling judges what to decide. So it looks like that whole structure of the, of the uh, legal political uh, uh, committees may change. How, how that's going to be worked out, I don't know. Two months ago, I would have said it's not going to change. Now it might. It, it very well might. Um, uh, so uh, officials are to swear an oath to the Constitution. I take that very seriously. If you know your history, when Lincoln, when Congress was first met on July 4th, 1861, and Lincoln had to answer for his suppression of the writ of habeas corpus, for his jailing of hundreds of Southern sympathizers who might have attacked troops. One of his arguments was that he took an oath to the Constitution, to uphold the whole Constitution. And he said, am I supposed to uphold one provision of that Constitution and then let the rest be destroyed? Oaths. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a Jewish kid of, of an age that I'm not shocked at pictures of, uh, of skeletal bodies piled up anymore. I saw too many of them as I was a kid. But the one thing that really shocked me at the Holocaust Museum a decade ago or so were German judges swearing an oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler. 
rather than to a symbol like a flag or a constitution. So taking an oath to a constitution can be an important thing. The risk, of course, is that uh, uh, the Constitution is loaded with all kinds of rights. People, if they start taking them seriously, are going to start pushing against party control. It's highly unlikely that Xi Jinping is going to feel that he or the party that he controls or, or leads is going to be constrained by judicial ruling. So don't expect the, the Supreme Court of China anytime soon to tell the government what to do. But at the lower level, at the lower level, <clears throat> uh, the, the uh, courts are now going to be used to try to control corruption. <clears throat> now, one of the things that was said uh, about uh, uh, this move was that some said it was more uh, like rule by law than rather than rule of law, but it's still in advance. Uh, the NPR had a story just the other day that cited uh, the a late constitutional scholar, I'm not familiar with, Kai Dingjian, described the evolution of China's legal system as a three-phase process, with each representing an object. For centuries, uh, Kai said, uh, China's laws were like a knife, a weapon with which rulers punish their subjects. In more recent times, it has, law has resembled a conductor's baton, a tool for rulers to order and orchestrate society. In the final phase, the law will resemble a horse's rein, a tool for citizens to limit official power. <clears throat> and he says that China is only entering the second phase. Anyone who studied Western law knows that this Chinese adage applies as well to the long centuries that it took for the rule of law to develop in European civilization. Uh, uh, and you know, we know that achieving stability and a decent life under law is, in fact, a never-ending struggle. If, if, we, if we don't continue to fight, uh, it, it, will, it will go away. Uh, so I think we can take from the demise of the third degree in the United States and the shift to even more civilized methods of police interrogation in China, a glimmer of light that Chinese policing can in the future become less abusive. talk for an hour, I don't know, it's, that sort of takes up all of your time, I, I apologize, I, but uh, I, if you have questions. Yes. Um, can we go back to the slide on, um, I believe it's defensive torture? So what, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is just how far we've progressed in the United States with respect to torture. Well, I think, um, I, 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 I think there's an argument that our form of torture has matured, but that in fact we're still engaged in torture. So I'm thinking, for example, of Ken Burns's documentary about the Central Park Five, where he does a really good job of capturing the way in which police officers in that case subjected five young men to an interrogation that actually produced. Um, a, a set of, of lies with respect to the confession. And if I may draw an analogy to it was South Africa. was a prosecutor, Africa. by the way. Pardon, what was the, that? The interrogation was conducted by prosecutors. Prosecutors and also police officers okay. in that case. Um, but if I can draw an analogy with South Africa, um, I think that country has learned that you don't have to have de facto, you don't have to have de jure segregation in order to perpetuate de facto segregation, that you don't have to have the sort of obvious laws that perpetuate a kind of <coughs> oppression in order for that oppression to continue to perpetuate. So you don't need the sort of obvious physical torture, and you can achieve the same thing with a more um, subtle form of torture in the United States. So it's not clear to me how far we've advanced um, as a nation with respect to the issue of torture um, in order to be some sort of model for another country. And then the slide on... Yeah, is, I don't think we're a great model. So that's one question, okay. And then there is the defensive torture slide. It's a, right. Well, I wanted to take you back. Okay. Because your question, you know, is there a question, is there a difference between being physically beaten, uh, being, being put in a, in a cell next to a furnace with rotten meat for two days, uh, a, a waterboard and the like, and being put in a, in a room 
where a police officer talks to you uh, and uses all kinds of trickery uh, and subtle pressures uh, to get a confession. And, and I would say yes, but, but uh, I would like to see the U.S. move towards the peace model. Uh, I mean, I don't want the police to, to not investigate crimes as long as confessions are, uh, interrogation is available. Uh, I think there are more civilized ways to do it. And what we've learned from the use of the Inbauri technique is that it also produces a lot of false confessions. Uh, uh, and that's a whole other, whole other lecture. Uh, but um, empirical studies show that most interrogations in the US are concluded within an hour or two. And uh, a lot of the false confession cases that we read about, confessions go on for much longer. Uh, and a much higher percentage of false confessions are obtained from teenagers and people with mental deficits, low IQs or certain forms of psychosis. Um, but that said, I mean, I still think that we should be moving towards that, towards that, that, that peace model. Uh, one reads about very few instances of, of beatings. It probably happens. Um, police are much better educated. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the criminal justice uh, 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 field, you know, scholarship, really, it's a new field. Uh, I think it's had its greatest effect on, on, on higher police officials. But I think there is sort of a civilizing uh, uh, trend in, uh, among, among police. There was one notorious case of real torture, you know, uh, electric shock and that sort of thing, beatings uh, in Chicago in the uh, Area 2 a Police Department under John Burge, rather a notorious case. And it just stands out in such sharp relief from what doesn't happen elsewhere. It really was a throwback to the third era. So, oh, and <clears throat> now we're seeing this tremendous wave of videotape. There are now something like 10 states that require videotaping. Apparently, the Detroit PD the videotapes interrogations and murder cases. Now, whether they videotape the entire confession, but it's um, uh, there's been quite a move to, to try to understand and deal with it. But, but uh, the problem is it may get us stuck in the psychologically coercive uh, instead of moving on. So anyway, but that's a, that's a good that's a good. Well, so, and you had a second. I, uh, yeah, one <coughs> other question, and thank you so much for responding to the question because now I, I, I can see the value. The value is resonating in the UK peace model. I, I think now I have a better understanding that uh, understanding that as an interrogation method with inherent checks and balances um, that could potentially lead to more accurate confessions as well. But the slide that. Um, yeah. discuss the defensive torture that that slide so when I saw that slide my initial thought was just about every one of those statements could be used to the case involving Michael Brown and the Ferguson police <coughs> um, and it made me realize that there's something about framing a human being as a suspect or a criminal that gives the state license to then treat that person as less than human. So there's something about the framing of Michael Brown as a suspect, this framing of Michael Brown as a criminal, that allows public discourse and perhaps even the criminal justice system to engage Brown in all of those ways. So in particular, what difference does it make if you hit a bad person a few times? What difference does it make if you execute a teenager in the street if he's robbed a convenience store? Um, you know, there's something about that framing. So really quickly, you, you, you mentioned um, photographs of the Holocaust. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Eric Erickson, who came up with this idea of pseudo-speciation. He was studying the, he's a behavioral psychologist. He was st studying the Holocaust. Earlier, a little, a little beyond me. Really quickly, I'll, I'll sum this up very quickly, but he was studying the Holocaust, and he, his basic inquiry was, how did average citizens become complicit in genocide or participate in gen genocide? So how, for example, did the mailman 
um, suddenly become complicit in genocide if not an active participant. And his theory was one of pseudo-speciation, that every culture subdivides into other cultures, and then those cultures create these huge myths about who is human and who's not human. And the myths are so powerful, they, they actually take on a material reality. And so pseudo-speciation dictates that there are going to be a group of people in any society who are framed as animals. And what this slide prompted me to think is part of the framing of Michael Brown as an animal through criminality or the suspicion of criminality enables this kind of treatment from the state. I, I, I wouldn't disagree, I, I, <clears throat> uh, but, but I, would, I would think that um, uh, the, the situation of uh, interrogating a suspect in a police station uh, is, is, is different from an on-the-street encounter. Um, and, uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of work in policing. <clears throat> My <clears throat> colleague Brad Smith has done a lot of work on the excessive use of force by the police and um, uh, sort of racial threat factor uh, working in that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the link between race and mass incarceration, I have my graduate students read uh, Michelle Alexander's Beach and Crow. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, major, it's a major problem. Uh, my own uh, my own gut feeling, and you're obviously much more adept at, at this kind of social analysis than I am, as to why um, the, uh, the the nation has erupted at this point uh, with this with this uh, business in Ferguson, Missouri, is that I think we are at a at a point of change. Uh, there's been uh, a movement to uh, against mass incarceration now for four years. Conservatives, uh, the uh, Right on Crime organization, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, the state of Texas, lots of conservatives now are, are saying we've got to get away from mass incarceration. Whether they're willing to go the full route to, to do that remains to be seen. So I think that, that this touches a chord at a time when change is possible. Maybe uh, in 2000, late 90s, uh, even 2010, it may not have been possible, but I think there's a sense that, that change is possible. And, uh, 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 well, I, I would agree with the generalities. I think we're, we're a long way from, uh, from uh, Einsatz group in, uh, <laughs> in, in, in the US. And, uh, you know, most cops are you know, trying to do a decent thing. We had a couple of other, other hands like this. And, uh, Oh, sorry. Okay, so just to kind of jump off of that, I mean, I think what's really interesting about this case is that this is a case where actually the suspects are being compelled to frame themselves. So there's something going on interesting about, I don't know, I'm, I, this whole idea that confessions matter, evidence doesn't matter unless you have a confession. Um, so I, I kind of feel like um, there's something very interesting going on here. Like this, this provides an interesting case to unpack the relationship between police legitimacy and torture. And I think, you know, in the politics of shame, usually we think of, you know, we tend to think of police torture that like you see torture and that's that automatically delegitimizes the police. Like for example, the, the Ferguson case, this is a this is a crisis of police legitimacy. But it almost seems, and I'm thinking about in terms of corruption, um, widespread kind of suspicion regarding the corrupt state. Um, I'm thinking about, um, my sense in China is that there's a very powerful central police, but the local police are very weak and their jurisdiction is actually cut into a lot, but, so they can't actually even, pro like they can't even investigate a lot of crimes. Uh, like they can do like petty, like drug crimes, but not like social unrest and, and that sort of thing. And so I'm wondering, is this a case in which torture is a vehicle of the police legitimacy? So is this a case in which, um, by producing suspects that, that so the, the suspects basically become collaborators in their own criminalization in such a way that police are then legitimated by this process. And so is there a, so are we seeing like a different relationship between police legitimacy and torture than we usually think of, um, you know, in the West, so. Um, <coughs> interesting, I think there are several, <coughs> several issues back in there. In terms of legitimacy, I think there are some societies where uh, the use of force up to a certain point 
is, is more accepted than, than, uh, than in other societies. Um, I don't really know enough about China to suggest that it may be more acceptable uh, uh, to, to people there. Uh, I think in the U.S. It, cha it changed over time. I sometimes thought that uh, <coughs> the um, softening, uh, the the uh, uh, the the softening of, of Western uh, approaches to the use of, of casual violence as a as a technique might have had something to do with changing nature of work. You know, when people stopped using horses and whips and, and heavy, grueling physical labor, uh, labor-saving devices may, may make us less um, uh, willing to accept the sort of physical abuse of, of people in, in, in the U.S. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I suspect that public opinion polls in the U.S. while talking about tough on crime would draw a line at, at physical abuse. Now, the other thing that I don't know enough about China, a doctor who is a real expert on Chinese policing, um, uh, dealing with central government versus locality, I would almost reverse that. Clearly, there are major cases that challenge the government where the central government is going to play a role. So the Bo Lai case, and it's Beijing is, is definitely going to manage that show trial. <clears throat> what I've learned as I've started reading intensely about China is the, the degree to which, like the U.S., uh, it's uh, uh, remarkably uncentralized. It's very hard for the central government to control what goes on in one of its 31 provinces or, or, or 6,000 cities or, or 100,000 towns and villages, so that the local police may be able to get away with a lot. Um, and, and even though there is a law on the books that says that torture is illegal and any evidence will be, will be dismissed, uh, the police are just doing their work. They've got to do some production. Lord knows how corrupt the local police are. They get some poor white and they beat them up and uh, nobody is going, to, is going to squawk about that. And uh, my sense is that um, the central government almost cannot structurally change the very nature of the way in which the bureaus of public safety and the bureaucracy are set up. You have a, uh, a, a working railroad and, uh, and making major structural changes to that probably are close to impossible, uh, just as it's difficult, say, for presidents in the United States to make major structural changes without a lot of congressional buy-in, et cetera. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I don't have a, a, a clear answer, but there is there is a lot that goes on there. One other, this is just really short, but one yeah, other well, thing that I was thinking of is, get, oh, is just David Garland's argument regarding the death penalty in public opinion might be, you said, like, how do you compare public opinion on torture in China to the uh, US context? That might be something to compare in terms of. Yeah, I've read um, stuff on, on in fact, the, this cultural context comes from a, a, an anthology that Austin Sarrett and somebody else wrote, and, where they talked about. And the book is about death penalty. There are several chapters on China. Uh, death penalty is fairly popular in East Asia, uh, and all East Asian countries uh, have the death penalty. But they don't use it very much, except for except for China. So yes, that would be a good a good comparison. Well, yeah, I have several thoughts in regard to several questions that, uh, that you mentioned so much. Uh, but my first thought was, uh, in relationship to like the Ferguson thing, and, uh, was I was thinking that you know everywhere we go now, we have cameras everywhere. We have cameras now on the streets. We have, UK is putting up cameras here, and then we got cameras cameras on the Even cameras house. here. We got, yeah, we, we got. Uh, I'll live forever. <laughs> <laughs> And now we're bringing cameras into the, uh, talking about cameras bringing them into the courtroom. You know, um, and, and I began to think about, you know, George Orwell's 1984, where, you know, the cameras everywhere, and the government puts cameras, you know, the whole thing. And, and it got me to thinking about the idea that nothing is public or official anymore with us on camera. That's my first thought. You know, uh, how do you, how do you look at anything? Because everything's on camera, you know? And then how do you, you know, that's, that's my first thought. My second thought was, you know, uh, with regard to the 
the whole thing, when, I, when you first talked about, talked about torture, you began to talk China. I too was thinking about waterboarding, because I had a, a friend who was a, a police officer, and he, he was very upset about when waterboarding started with the, the subjects. He said, he said, he said, he said to me, he said, waterboarding doesn't simulate drowning, it is drowning. Where, whoa, whoa, where did he view or participate in that? No, he, well, he didn't, but he did, but. Reading he, he, about the use by the CIA in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I understand. Okay. So, but, but those are two of my thoughts. Was first of all, the, the whole, the idea that everything has to be on camera, that wherever we go now, <clears throat> and that in a society where we say, it's, we talk about totalitarian society, in a, in a democratic society where we're trying to have everything open and, and fresh in the air and everything, we have cameras everywhere, so what good does that do in terms of the, pol of the justice system? How does that interfere with you know, our, our use of Then the whole idea of, 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 of interrogating suspects. Is psychological torture any different than physical torture other than the obvious physical torture? <laughs> Well, um, okay. In terms of cameras, uh, 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 a different technology has had a tremendous effect on Chinese society, and that's uh, internet and social media. And uh, that has um, allowed the spread of dissent and, uh, and exposing governmental officials. Uh, and I think that, uh, that, and this is very rapid. I mean, this is only within the last like eight years. So that the Chinese government, I think, has had to be more responsive to the complaints of people because of social media, which is a form of photo, uh, which is kind of a camera, right? It, it opens up society of lots of people seeing things. Uh, so I think it does tend, you know, uh, to the, the, the degree that people can see things that, that with our technology. Uh, things that are seen go viral. Uh, it, it, it can have an effect on public opinion, and it can be very immediate. It can allow the organization of, uh, of, of movements, short life movements, uh, or, or perhaps longer ones, uh, in ways that were not possible before. So I see it more as a tool for democratization than for, than for uh, sort of Orwellian control. Although, uh, you know, it may depend on many other very serious structural uh, factors of society. Uh, th those techniques led to the Arab Spring, but there appear to be uh, structural, factional, uh, tribal kinds of issues, uh, in, uh, 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 dom denominational, religious denominational issues within the Middle East that have gone from democratization to civil war in Syria and, and uh, you know, a return of a repressive government uh, uh, to Egypt, where the, the alternative might have been a, a religious, religious control. Um, I, I think that uh, I'd be careful about using the word totalitarian in relationship to China. I have no problem saying it's an authoritarian society, but I don't think it, it, it it has the same kind of total control that you know were attempted by mid 20th century is there, is there? totalitarian states. But the, certainly in the U.S. Uh, criminal justice, uh, the use of cameras is seen as a method of, of bringing uh, measures of decency and control in, in the when we open up the interrogation, the secret interrogation, where anything could happen where now we have required cameras, uh, the tendency that's been building for decades towards a more bureaucratic, business-like approach is only going to continue. Yeah, I think there's a difference between physical torture, I think I made that clear, and psychological psychological coercion, but I think we should go that, that, extra, that extra step. Uh, I think now what we have a move towards with miniaturization is that cops are going to be you know, wearing uh, cameras on their lapels or their hats so that the, the kinds of interactions that we now get on, on, on automobile stops are going are to happen. Uh, I'll leave you with this conundrum. Uh, Seattle was about to put 200 uh, cameras on the lapels of their police officers. And uh, a few days ago, 
uh, a person who runs a business where, where they put these things on camera, put in a, uh, a preliminary FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request, to get every single one of these. And now the department is saying, in order to protect the privacy of people who are screening, we're going to have to have too many officers who are going to monitor them. We just can't afford to do it. So one, one form of democracy may make another form <laughs> difficult. <laughs> uh, my answer would be bring in the lawyers. But, so thank you. It's been uh, a lot of fun.